The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the call. My name is Nicole Horsford and I'm Senior Manager of Member Services at the IAB and really excited about the turnout for today's session. I think it may actually be our most popular to date. And that really says a lot about interest in the topic at hand, display advertising, how it has evolved, uh, the importance of display to our industry, and also speaks to the major advances we have made due to emerging and innovative technology, things like RTB and programmatic buying. So today we'll be hearing from Jonathan Schwartz, who will open up the presentation with um, an introduction on how media has evolved and where we are today with the display ecosystem. Then picking up from there will be Dax Hammond, Chief Revenue Officer at Chango, who will dive a little bit deeper into an explanation on how things like big data, programmatic buying, and Facebook exchange all play a role in this new world of buying and selling. And then lastly, we'll hear from Amy King, VP Product Marketing at Evidon, and Todd Ruback, Chief Privacy Officer at Evidon, on the value of revealing the invisible web, and also what privacy online means for publishers today. So to give you a, a quick frame for the conversation, internet advertising revenues in the US totaled $17 billion for the first six months of 2012. Uh, in Q2, the number was approximately $8.7 billion, and display-related advertising accounted for $2.9 billion, or 33% of total revenues during that quarter. These numbers are from the IEB Internet Advertising Revenue Report, conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers, and results are released each quarter. And according to eMarketer, they forecast that display ad spending growth in 2013 will actually outpace that of paid search ad spending, uh, mostly driven by digital video advertising and sponsorship. So display is, is really big news for our industry um, and big dollars for our industry. So before we start, uh, just a couple housekeeping announcements. All participants are on mute and will be taking your live questions throughout the webinar through your chat feature. And we'll also, if we have time at the end, we'll have a quick Q&A after the session. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available on IEB.net. I will send out a link to everyone on the call on how to access. So now I will turn it over to Jonathan Schwartz, Vice President East Coast Sales at Net Mining, who will begin the presentation with a brief history on display advertising. Jonathan? Thank you. Just waiting for the screen share. Okay. And let's go to All right, does everybody see that resolution okay? Let's see. All right. So I know there's a wide variety of people with different degrees of experience in the field. So I'm going to focus our little history lesson probably just on the last maybe eight to 10 years. Because that's where some uh, pivotal things happened that brought us to where we are today with a lot of uh, you know, more data we can activate, media against programmatic buying or RTB. So that's where we'll, we'll start. So you know, how did we get to where we are today? Well, in around 2003, that was the time at which really networks came in, you know, locked up a lot of disintermediated ad inventory, making it easier for marketers and agencies to buy reach. You know, up until that time, especially at the advent of the Internet, it was really the, the big portals, kind of key positions or slotting fees, and then it sort of migrated quickly to buying sites on the three C's, community, commerce, and content. Um, but this really allowed people better access to wider pools of inventory. You know, around 2005, this is really where there was a shift in the way both publishers and marketers thought about how they bought media or sold media. So, you know, it wasn't solely based on the, the three C's, like I said before, or just going after, you know, specific sites based on who they thought their audiences were. 
they really started thinking about audiences they sought and how they might find individuals right, that had characteristics that they desired or audience bodies. This is really kind of the birth of behavioral targeting. And this is really the way media, other media or mediums were bought, print, radio, television. It was always based on audiences. And it's also the first time in terms of um, you know, targeting that it, it offered something that resembled search, which already had started to overtake display in terms of the proportion of ad dollars going into that channel. And search, I think, only makes up still about only 4% of the time people spend on the Internet. So it really got a disproportionate share of ad, ad dollars versus the time people spent actually searching for things. You know, around 2007, when exchanges, predominantly right media, I believe was the first, came into the fold, you know, they actually created the possibility of going the other way, sort of disaggregation. So in other words, democratizing inventory and impressions and allowing other players to fill in uh, the components to bridge that value deficit and separating kind of the inventory and decisioning from the data or the audiences they were trying to go after, which really led to where we are today, which only was a few years ago, uh, the introduction of RTB. And this introduced the idea that audiences could be broken down to individuals. And each individual would have a unique value to each specific advertiser, uh, creating a different value proposition to both publishers as well as providing an auction-based system to uh, sell their inventory and provide a wider buying audience to buy their inventory. So let's just spend a little bit of time on what actually be what what RTB actually is or how it how it works because a lot of times people you know there's some confusion around that. So th this is. Mine and net mining's attempt to, to break it down uh, as simply as we can. So on the left is the intended target audience. And the way you can go after that audience, or the different attributes you can uh, kind of segment them into could be the time of day, uh, the context in which they're consuming content, the geographic location, the actual ad placement itself, and then you know various audience segments or sub-segments. So where you see that shirts on sale, uh, where the website is, in a very, very short period of time, that's an empty spot on which an ad can appear. What happens is, is when that person arrives on that page, the ad server says, oh, that, that's somebody that has these certain attributes. I want to go see who is willing to bid to serve that user an ad impression. So a call goes out through the various uh, places in the supply side of ad inventory. So that could be an exchange, a supply side platform, or a publisher themselves. They look at the desired target attributes and they put that ad impression out to bid. Now we have three platforms here bidding on that, uh, bidding to serve that ad impression. It could be 20. You know, all of these things happen in about a third of the time it takes you to blink your eye, if you can imagine all that decisioning. So in this example, the platform one decides, yep, that is somebody I'm interested in. They bid $1.50 to serve that person an, an ad. Platform two in this example decides, you know what, I'm not interested in bidding on that ad impression. And platform three decides that they're interested in bidding and they bid $1.25. So in this case, the $1.50 bid wins and sends that ad to the page to be served to that user that they're targeting. And again, all in, this, all in one third of the time it takes you to blink your eyes. So that's pretty powerful. Again, it, it really allows the ecosystem to, to look at people as individuals versus audiences that have characteristics. And it does all of this in real time. So obviously it makes it a lot more valuable for marketers as well as advertisers and their agencies. So let's talk about why this really matters. If you can imagine driving down the, well, somewhere warmer than New York, I'll tell you right now, somewhere in your convertible, and you got four different people in the car, you know, imagine, and scarily enough, this may happen, who knows someday, but uh, imagine if each person in that automobile could be shown an ad, a billboard ad along the highway that directly spoke to their particular interests or passions at that moment in time. So 
So the rear pass, you know, the driver's side passenger, maybe they're going to college and they're looking at the horrific cost of textbooks and want to want to rent them instead. Or the person in the driver's seat is like, you know what, kind of sick of this convertible. I think I'd like to look at new models uh, to buy for myself. The woman in the front seat might be thinking about better ways to, uh, you know, uh, use credit cards to spend her money more efficiently so she gets the most mileage out of that card literally and can use that to plan her dream vacation. And the person in the uh, passenger seat on the uh, in the back seat you know, has a prom coming up and all she cares about is getting a, you know, a beautiful prom dress. So that's, that's really what RTV allows us to do is to single out individuals based on their passions, their interests, their characteristics and serve them the appropriate ad hopefully at the right time and at the right price based on their value to that particular marketer. Let's talk about what RTB is not. You know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, RTB means race to the bottom, there's all these other ac you know, acronyms, but uh, what it's not is it does not equal remnant. Remnant implies, you know, has a negative connotation or it's ad inventory that couldn't be sold. And in, you know, not many years ago that really was true, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a function of lack of demand. It was just the there wasn't enough access to that inventory in an efficient way to allow people to actually buy it. Um, it's also not exclusively exchange inventory. There's a lot of inventory sources through which you can access inventory through RTB. And lastly, it, RTB does not equal low quality, which sort of aligns with, uh, with Remin, and that is there's plenty of premium content, premium properties, high value users that can be accessed through RTB, which why it's makes it so powerful and effective and efficient from a price perspective because, it, again, it allows you to value each user at a point in time um, for each individual marketer based on what they're trying to accomplish with their display advertising. So if you think of uh, RTB, we'll, we'll, we'll put up our version of the, this is the clean version of the, the Lumascape I'm sure everybody's tired of looking at, but this, this really just boils it down in its simplest terms. And that is on the, on the demand side, you have a marketer interested in finding a particular audience. They want to pay a particular price to serve that audience their ad. They go through the supply side, which is ad networks, demand side platforms. Uh, and then they have to speak through RTB to the other tech side of the equation, which is the supply side. And those are exchanges, supply side platforms, which ultimately uh, give them access to inventory on all the individual sites or publishers. And that's the supply. So RTB, yeah, think of it really as a conduit of the pipe, right? It's the pipe, not the water. It's the wire, not the electricity. It just provides a mechanism for these two sides to speak with one another, with each other and provide an open marketplace to most hopefully effectively and efficiently uh, provide access to inventory sources so all marketers can message to their intended target audiences, hopefully at a, at a value that you know, is, aligns with what their goals are. And then how you can utilize audience targeting or branding through RTB. And uh, some of my colleagues, uh, next up, Dax Hammond, will talk a little bit more about different data sets and how to utilize them to find your audiences. You know, this is really where, whether it's through first party data, and everybody's heard big data ad nauseum. Dax hopefully will demystify that a little bit. But it's, it's understanding what attributes and characteristics you're trying to find in your target audience and how to employ which types of data sets to find those segments and message to them most effectively and efficiently. And RTB really is a great mechanism uh, to do that. So on the left, left side of the different data sets and characteristics you can employ, and if you've got a smart engine that can you know, compile all of that data and tell their RTB bidder what to look for, on the right you can get to your intended audience and some of those characteristics here listed are you know, again, can be gotten from different data sources and you can find your intended audience. So that's kind of it. You know, the reason why certainly we in that mining love RTB is that you know, it's flexible, it's efficient, it's scalable, and it's measurable. You know, in, a, in, a, in an on-demand consumer world, which we all face, you know, consumers, their content consumption habits have become incredibly fragmented and difficult to figure out what they're consuming when and where and on what device. So they're really in the driver's seat. So it's really up to us to figure out how to engage with them, when the most appropriate time is, 
what to pay for them depending on where they are in their purchase journey. Um, it allows you to value users individually as individuals. So it minimizes waste, and you can also predict uh, where they're likely to uh, be in terms of you know contextual landscape. Uh, so with a combination of data and context and a rich creative canvas, again, through RTB, you really have the ability to find your audiences and you can measure the success of those campaigns in a variety of ways. And I've listed some of the kind of the fancy new versions that uh, net mining is already doing, which can be things like, did I drive people to actually tune into my new show or the new season of uh, Girls? You know, did I drive an increase in offline purchases of my brand in all of my you know, grocery and retail outlets. Did I actually drive purchases of my automobiles, and how you know can I see that through actual DMV registration? So these are just some of the things and new innovations that are taking place um, that we we are certainly excited about, and, and the marketers and advertisers should be as well, uh, because it just opens up a whole new way to target and also measure um, how campaigns perform. So I'm going to turn it over to Dax from Chango. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll just wait for the controls to pass here. OK, and we should be all set. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Dax. Uh, the company is Chango. Um, my role here is Chief Revenue and Strategy Officer and member of the founding team, which also means I'm T-boy and, uh, uh, and post-boy when needed. Um, the easy way to think of Chango for the sell side people on the phone is that we provide a, a technology layer for solving programmatic and a lot of the issues Jonathan just talked about. And for the buy side people on the phone, we solve prospecting and converting um, in, uh, uh, in simple ways. I love listening to Jonathan's presentation because it, it's quite amazing how much this industry has changed in the last few years. And, and the fascinating thing that I think keeps digital marketing and RTB fresh is that everything you knew six months ago is only partly relevant today. And everything you know today will only be partly relevant six months from now. It really is a changing world. Jonathan made a good point about the perception of RTB and, and, uh, and exchange for media that very recently it was all the remnant stuff. It was that you as the sell side folks uh, didn't want any more and you were pushing it out to clearing houses to try and earn something on the dollar uh, which was above the zero you were getting historically. And the exchanges were a great idea. Their, their goal was to try and create fair market price and hopefully drive up CPM. As many of you know, on this call, effectively on the opposite, and in many cases, it, it declines the uh, the CPM that uh, that media owners can achieve. So, let's have a look at um, uh, at some of those points and elements now. Um, first of all, there's a really important way that you have to look at this world, and that is that under this new paradigm, what's happened is the data and the media have become separated. So, as the media has gone into the exchanges that Jonathan referenced. The data has not. And so if you're on the sell side, the scary thing now is that you're not really packaging up the data and the media together. The buyer is coming in and saying, well, I'm interested in your media. And that media might have nothing at all to do with the quality content that you're investing in to put up on that site, and more to do with the fact that they simply have a retargeting pixel on an individual. And that's where one of the biggest problems come from. Um, Yahoo, for instance, looks at Stanford blocking retargeting companies for a while in the hope of trying to fix that, but that didn't necessarily um, work out for them. And so we've created this situation where for the sellers it's a terrible situation because the buyers know more about your inventory than you do. And for the buyers it's a fantastic opportunity because uh, they have all of the control and can set value based on things that matter to them and, and to their advertisers. So it's a very interesting um, shift in a very short period of time. I always find it useful to use the matrix films as an analogy. Apologies for maybe the one or two of you on here that, uh, uh, that might not be familiar with this film, but uh, I think most of you will be. This screenshot is from the exact moment in the movie where the lead character, Neo, starts 
seeing the world for the very first time as code. He stops seeing people as being really people. And instead, he sees all this kind of code floating about that, that makes up these individuals. That's kind of the way we have to think about uh, RTB um, and this term programmatic that we're going to debunk in a moment. Um, we can't think of it as people. We don't really know who these individuals are. We just have some sort of identifier or cookie about uh, on them. And then we have lots of points of information and data assigned to them. And if you can shift your thinking into uh, in, in, to align with that, then you're in a much stronger position than a lot of other people out in the industry who I think are still too worried about finding these real individuals that perhaps may or may not exist. So let's try and keep things simple. I, I love this meme. Um, I, I think it, it's so useful for our industry. And um, we seem to love making things extremely hard for ourselves. And it's almost as though we feel within this industry that our salaries are tied to the number of three-letter acronyms we can create and, and, and the jargon we can use. The two terms that are huge this year um, and will be, I think, for, for the next year or two are big data and programmatic models. So, so let's address those for a moment because in some ways it's the next evolution of RTB and in other ways it's the exact same thing as RTB. And so let's take big data for a moment. Several definitions out there. Really what it means is unstructured data, lots of it in disparate sources. So instead of having one nice clean database where everything fits about the people you want to know, this data is coming in from all sorts of places and it's cumbersome to work with. By definition that's what it means. A simpler way to think of it, big data is just more data than you're probably using in your marketing program today. Simple as that. Now we know as marketers, if we're going to go all the way back to the overused paradigm of uh, talking to the right person at the right time with the right message, big data or more data helps us to do that because we know more about the individual. And so if big data is so difficult and so cumbersome and so spread out, programmatic marketing is the solution to that problem. Programmatic marketing simply means bringing lots of stuff together in a rules-based way so that you can make that data actionable. Anything else that people try and say about big data and programmatic marketing is simply because it's probably to their advantage to, to make it sound confusing to you. Um, now the data that you can use is, is not so obvious and, and it always amazes me that marketers on both the buy and the sell side seem to struggle a little bit to understand what data they have and, and what value that data has. First of all, let's take your site data, or if you're on the buy side, your client site data, or your own site data. The fact that somebody has visited your page is first party data. That's what we mean by first party data. Um, it tells you something about that person. It tells you what products they looked at, how long they spent there is a good indicator. A 10 second visit versus a 10 minute visit is very different things. That's useful data. You also probably have a CRM database that you have access to, and of course you have those people who convert and all of the attributes about that conversion. What did they buy? How much did they spend? How often do they come back? And on and on and on and on. And this first party data is extremely uh, important and has more value than you probably realize. At the moment, within most organizations, that data sits in lots of different places and is owned by different stakeholders. This is the promise of programmatic. It's a way to bring it all together. And then you have lots of third-party data sources. The one that we've curated is we're actually the second largest source of search data in the US, UK, and Canada. Um, more search data than Yahoo and Bing combined in a month. And it means that you could do programmatic marketing by saying, well, I want to find everybody who has visited my product page and has also searched for one of my competitive brand firms on Google, Yahoo, or Bing in the last three days. That's the that's a, a real-life example of how a programmatic combines first-party data and third-party data. And now when you think back to that paradigm we had of the breaking row from media and data separating from each other, you can understand why the buy side has so much power. In this example, we talk about, uh, uh, in this illustration, we talk about the Facebook exchange, and we're going to come back on to that a little bit more. But this could be any type of exchange or RTB or inventory where this data can be used. And of course, this isn't going away anywhere. Um, this was a, a study put together recently, and it shows perhaps the amount of uh, media being bought within the digital environment by 2015 through real-time bidding will be about 50%. As we're going to talk about the Facebook exchange shortly, that number may increase significantly. Um, but to, to add on something Jonathan was saying about the quality of the inventory now in the exchanges, um, it, that caused a, 
a correlated shift in who buys real time. It used to be just the world of direct response marketers. Now the brand marketers are flooding in because they also see the value in being able to hone in on uh, an audience more efficiently than perhaps they were before. But I do want to warn everybody, particularly those on this call on the buy side, that there is this RTD and data high. I hear so many marketers, talk, marketers talking about this wonderful data and these really sexy algorithms that they have. And, and how fantastic is that? And very rarely is anybody ever talking today about the creative or the context of where the message is found. Both of those things still remain critical. Programmatic and big data and RTB can help you get the message in front of the right person. You still have the responsibility as a master of putting out a good message that looks good and is appealing to these people. Advertising is still an emotive practice, not a pixel and cookie practice. And the other point is context. You know, for the sell side people on the call, the great news is context matters. I know, for instance, for a client selling luxury car brand, um, that I can get them significantly more impact than they're advertising, or significantly more conversion, even using search data, if I put the ad on a high brand type site, or I put it on an automotive related site, than I can if I put it on somewhere like PMD.com. And so, go along with RTB, it's incredibly valuable for you, but don't get caught up in the high and lose track of the basics of advertising. Now, RTB has caused another shift. Um, uh, a shift that has caused me to write probably what is the geekiest, most terrible joke um, that anyone's ever written about this industry. When is an ad work not an ad network? When it's an ad network. And we, there's something very specific we mean about this. It used to be so terribly simple. If you said to a company, what are you? And they said, well, I'm an ad network, you'd say, great. You would know that if we use this Forrester uh, breakdown, that an ad network would buy in media from the sell side They'd aggregate it together. They might allow you to buy across a number of sites all at one time. They might allow you to add good party attributes and say, instead of just buying this site, I want to buy across all 10 sites in your network and just target those people that you know are women. That's great. That's what that network was. It was all kind of a black box, and they made very nice margin of it. An ad exchange is completely opposite. In theory, it's a completely open and fair market trading place. And uh, there is this concept of private private exchanges and first look versus subsequent look and so on. And if anyone has questions on this, feel free to reach out to us. I'm sure any of us as panelists can answer your questions about that and the impact that it's had on the industry. Um, but the reason for the joke, if I can call it that, is that a lot of ad networks realized that they were um, at a disadvantage by being an ad network. And they actually just started buying media off the exchanges and ad networks stopped being ad networks and became more agencies and, and were buying exchange media just like anybody else was. Okay, so we always like on these types of calls um, to give you things as, as kind of takeaways and real examples to, to help you understand this world. And when we talk about data and people think about first party data, usually what people think of first of all is retargeting because retargeting is the event of somebody coming to a site that is data. What retargeting is is completely misunderstood in the industry, and everyone thinks that it's site retargeting. Somebody comes to a page, they leave, and then you do lots of stalking and follow them around. Retargeting is not that. Retargeting simply is about finding somebody who committed some sort of event or action. Now, if you look at this chart on the top right-hand side, site retargeting is indeed one of those things. You're retargeting them because they came to the page. But if you look at the top left-hand side of this chart and you look at search retargeting, for instance, the specific purpose of search retargeting is to find people who've never been to your site. And in this case, you're finding people who've searched on Google, you ask things, the things that matter to you, what people have never been to your site. That is a great example of using data in a real-time bidded world. And the practices of site retargeting and search retargeting are being used right across the web for prospecting and conversion and also within SDS that we'll come on to at the moment. I always like to give people a little reminder though, RTB inventory can be bought very cheaply. Um, at Chango, we fundamentally believe it should never be bought below a certain price for two reasons. One, because it helps us find quality, but two, we want to help sell sites. We believe that there should be an overall increase not too much for these sell side people uh, in CPM because we want you to produce more quality content. We want you to be able to afford to produce quality content because our advertising will work better. 
And so I always like to remind people that just because inventory is cheap and you can show lots of impressions to consumers doesn't mean to say you should. So stalking is when two people go for a long romantic walk together if only one of them knows it. Remember this when you're looking at your media plan and you're seeing your conversion uh, and your frequency tapping on our, um, an ROI on retargeting. Chances are you're showing more impressions than you need to to get the action you desire. And chances are you're making the consumers angry and they're really sick of hearing from you. You don't need to make them feel as though you're stalking them across the web. The idea is to remind them, not to annoy them. Okay, so lots of discussion over the last three to six months about the arrival of the Facebook exchange. And so we want to take a moment to talk about this and, and understand its, its impact. The logical thing to tell you is that Facebook exchange is just another RTB media source. The reality is right now it, you cannot think of it that way as a master. The uh, pricing is extremely low um, as opposed to clearing between say $1.50 and $4 for RTB inventory. You're sometimes talking about regularly clearing around 20 to 35 cents, which is crazy cheap. And so automatically that changes your bidding decisions and programmatic decisions. Um, also consumers from early uh, data seem to be converting faster than the campaigns that we've run so far, you, and you need to show them less impression. And so you have to think of it differently. We can't ignore the Facebook exchange. It's more than a billion people looking at Facebook numbers, and potentially they could become 25 cents for real-time board display inventory, which is an impressive amount. And so clearly this is going to have some sort of impact. Uh, again, if we look at this from both sides of the house, if you're on the buy side, there's never been a cheaper opportunity to go in and buy Facebook inventory. Um, it's only going to get more expensive now as more and more partners get invited to, uh, to have access to it. If you're on the sell side, I think you're going to see a short-term problem where lots of people are going to try investing money in this, particularly well because it's so cheap. And then I think as the price starts to rise again, then I think all this will settle down in six, 12 months from now. You're going to be back to where you were um, six to 12 weeks ago before the Facebook exchange switched on at, at, at any type of volume. That said, if you are on the sell side and you're doing things like audience extension, um, something you can do now with this programmatic approach, you could also expand your campaigns and inventory across the Facebook exchange. And you too could see Facebook as a positive thing, not as a negative thing, and take advantage of the low CPM in order to drive um, more efficiency for you. And I have one last point that I want to uh, make and share, and that is that for those of you on the call who haven't done as much in RTB or haven't done anything yet with F yet, any of the things that Jonathan and I so far have talked about, don't get too lost in the lead. You can get 80% of the benefit with 20% of the effort. Yes, you can uh, go off and find all these different sort of data sources and do all sorts of kinds of, of, of interesting stuff. Just start somewhere. Think back to that seven types chart that we looked at where we were talking about, you know, maybe just start by expanding your site retargeting into the concept of search retargeting so you're prospecting for new people. That's a good way to use this data. But also keep coming uh, to people like the IAB and using their resources to understand what the quick wins are because you're going to get a lot of benefit from, from a small amount of that initial effort outlay. And that's it from me and Chango. Um, as Nicole said, we're going to look at some questions at the end, but for now I'm going to uh, uh, pass over control to uh, Amy at uh, Evidon. Thank you. Amy, you should now have control. Thank you, Doug. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you to everyone who's on the phone. Um, today, we are going to reveal the invisible web by discussing big data and how, relate, how the related growth in both numbers and variety of ad technologies offers businesses great opportunities when properly monitored, controlled, and disclosed. I'm Amy King, VP of Product Marketing here at Evadon, and I will be addressing how website control increases company revenue. And I'm joined by Todd Rubach, our Chief Privacy Officer, who will be addressing the benefits of disclosure for companies along with an update of the DAA self-regulatory program. Thank you, Nicole, for your introduction, which actually already included some of the stats you see here on this slide. 
We all know about the dollar growth of the digital advertising space. A sector that's predicted to become a $500 billion market by 2015. As advances in ad targeting, consumer data collection, and big data management are going to get us to that point, but industry growth and capability and options it is accompanied by a proliferation of ad technologies, each there to help you succeed in a new or more efficient way. Companies now operate their sites in a complex web of vendors. This is what we call the invisible web. Dax used his matrix slide to represent a matrix of users, but we think of the matrix as the invisible web of ad techs that are behind the scenes powering online behavioral advertising. This web is rightly becoming more intricate as new solutions are invented. And while each offers a unique solution for you and your business, the implementation of these ad techs over time across various areas of websites has sometimes created an inefficient, vulnerable, and potentially costly tag structure for your pages and across the web. Uh, we here at Evidon see that the average website now has over 100 elements on its pages, and that's double from an average of only 50 just five years ago. So it's become essential as sites become more clogged to clean out the closet, if you will, and first take stock of your vendors then work to monitor tag structure and performance across your pages. We see here at Evidon from client calls that too often companies are not aware of all the vendors on their site. They don't know what motives these vendors may have as their business models evolve, which we see happening more and more, and their data collection policies change. And they are unsure of how and to what extent vendors may have access to user data. And even those who are not winning, and you know how even those who are not winning ad bids or placing pixels on various pages. So what do these issues mean for consumer privacy, data vulnerability, and website performance? Today we'll briefly touch on all three and explain why having insight into the complete tracking map across your website is essential for controlling who has access to your consumer data preventing ad tags or analytics tools from loading too slowly, and offering consumers tools to have some control over data collection. When it comes to privacy control, smart companies know that offering some options to consumers pays off. So I'm going to hand this discussion over to Todd now, who will walk through effective consumer privacy solutions and the DAA self-regulatory program. Thanks, Amy, and uh, thank you to the IAB for sponsoring this. This is uh, uh, truly informative, and, and I'm learning so much from listening to the speaker, so thank you again. Um, so online privacy is important, um, and how do we know that? Well, people, people care about it. Our, our customers, consumers, we all care about it. Um, we've seen that 48% of consumers say they're more likely to purchase from companies that give them transparency and control over uh, what's going on in the website vis-a-vis -vis their personal information. So this is an important business issue for companies doing online advertising and selling. So let me kind of back up for a moment. Um, all of this is great. But where's you know where to, to use a to date me? Where's the beef? Where where's the meat in all of this? So um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, a, a number of years ago um, said recognized the importance of online advertising as an industry and the value that it is giving um, as the internet has become really the main platform for commerce um, and. It also uh, was concerned at the same time that uh, people's privacy was being intruded upon. Um, so there was a, a, uh, a bubbling, a percolating um, critical mass that was coalescing saying we need to somehow regulate this industry. And the mechanism to do that would be through what's called do not track, and commonly known as DNT. Um, so there's a lot of discussion uh, within the industry as to whether this would be good for business and consumers and, and how to balance that approach. 
And what kind of sussed out from all of this is that the FTC gave the industry a bite of the nap, bite at the apple, saying, um, instead of implementing Do Not Track right now, what we're going to do is create a, a self-regulatory program in the OBA space in the United States. So um, that's what happened. So um, the self-regulatory program for OBA, online behavioral advertising, was developed in collaboration by six or seven of the leading trade associations. I'm going to try to name them. Uh, of course, the IAB, the NAI, a lot of acronyms here, the DMA, the Better Business Bureau, the ANA, the 4As, and I think AAF. I, I may be missing one or two. Um, and uh, the program was developed to apply consumer-friendly standards to, to online behavioral advertising. Um, if you will, think um, nutritional labels for ads. It, it's really similar um, in, in concept to that. So um, the DAA, in developing the, the OBA program, um, came up with seven guiding principles. And I'm just going to talk for two or three minutes about um, what these principles are. Um, they, uh, these principles correspond to the tenets proposed by the FT, by, by the Federal Trade Commission in February 2009. And the principles are designed to address consumer concerns about the use of personal information, uh, as well as uh, interest-based advertising, while preserving the innovative advertising that we just talked about and seen so many interesting slides. So the seven principles are education, uh, transparency, consumer control, data security, material change to existing OBA policies, um, sensitive data, and accountability. So just let me touch upon each one very quickly. Um, education principles. This calls for organizations to participate in efforts to educate consumers and businesses about OBA. Um, transparency principle calls for clearer and easily accessible disclosures to consumers about the data collection and use practices that's associated with the OBA. Uh, the third principle, which is consumer control, that uh, provides consumers with an expanded ability to choose whether their data is being is collected and used uh, for OBA purposes. Uh, the fourth principle, data security principle, calls for organizations to provide appropriate security uh, for and the limited retention of the data collected and used for OBA purposes. Uh, the fifth principle, material change principle, that calls for obtaining the consumer's consent, which we're going to talk about uh, in a moment, uh, before material change is made by the um, entities. Um, OBA uh, data collection and use policies. And the sixth principle, which we're going to talk about in a later slide, the sensitive data principle, uh, that recognizes that certain data collected from uh, children, for example, um, and used for OBA purposes merits heightened protection and requires parental consent. Uh, we'll talk about that and uh, COPPA, the Children's Online Protection, uh, Privacy Protection Act in a moment. And then the last principle is the accountability principle, um, and that calls for the development of programs to further advance these principles. Um, I referenced the Better Business Bureau. Thanks. So the program, the DAA program timeline, I, I referenced 2009. That's when it all started. Um, and uh, the, ICON, uh, the ICON program launched in 2010, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, in June of 2011, the DAA announced that there were already 100 program participants. Um, and in November of the same year, the DAA published their multi-site multi data principles. And then in 2012, in February, the White House jumped into the game um, uh, with an event uh, and, and offering its public support. Then in March of this past, of last year, uh, global licensing programs were kicked off in Europe and soon to kick off in Canada. Um, right now, or uh, as of October, there's over 11 million monthly visits to youradtoices.com, which is significant. 
And what's next? Well, we're going to see the DAA program being expanded into the area of mobile advertising, browser-based control mechanisms, and uh, continuing into global expansion. So what's all this mean? Time to get with the program. There's, there's real concern and, and uh, interest about this in D.C. with the FCC. Um, and there's enforcement going on. Um, recently, Facebook settled with the FCC over deceptive trade practice. Uh, charges. Um, and let me tell you, from having been in, in privacy law practice for many, many years, an investigation uh, in the defense of this can easily be $100,000, which may or may not be an insurable event. If it's not, that can have a direct impact on your bottom line. But there's active enforcement going on now. So what do you need to do? So um, in the U.S. Ad Choices Program, there's four things you need to do. You need to audit, audit and monitor the tracking that's going on on your website. You need to license the icons from the digital advertiser, the, the DAA, excuse me. Um, the cheap advertisers, it's 5500 a year, thereabouts. Um, do it. It's money well spent. You need to uh, disclose everything clearly to consumers so they can make an informed decision on both your website and in advertising. And you have to give consumers control, including uh, the ability to opt out of advertising. So what's it look like? Um, well, what we have here is a blue triangle, which is the ad choices icon. Um, and uh, let me share with you that, that the Evidon technology, um, we have a product suite called Inform made up of two control products. Um, this is our technology um, that helps companies comply with the self-regulatory program as well as the EU privacy directive. Um, and the first product is site notice. Um, in the site notice, this, um, we deliver an icon, which you're seeing here on the screen, which automa um, automatically on websites have allowed third-party data collection. And users have the option to click on the icon for more information. And when you click on the icon, this is what you see. Uh, an easy opt-out from each uh, reporting proves that uh, the request has been sent. And you get rich detail on each collector. You also have, uh, uh, we have ad, um, ad choice icon in advertisements. And here in the upper right-hand corner, you see that. And this allows a consumer the ability to see what's going on in the advertisements, who's tracking them, who are the trackers, and what cookies are going to be served up onto their computer. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, as a consumer, you can see the all, all vendors contributing, uh, targeting to an ad. And I referenced earlier the new copper rule, which ties back to uh, the privacy principle number six. Um, just very quickly, new copper rule uh, is important. The FPC just revised copper with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Uh, and the new revised rule is going to take effect July 1st, 2013. It's important for uh, online advertisers uh, because uh, personal information under the new rule is now going, it's been expanded to include persistent identifiers such as cookies, geolocation, photos, screen names, and more. It's going to apply to website operators and third parties, IG ad networks, who have actual knowledge that their site is directed at children under 13. And it's going to hold site operators strictly liable for the actions of third parties on their website. Um, also, they must inform parents and obtain parental consent. So with that, I'm going to kick it back to Amy. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Todd. Um, I'm going to quickly run through the rest so that we have time for questions and don't go over on the webinar. But I'm going to, um, as Todd has just gone through some of the consumer privacy tools that are offered to consumers for websites and within ads, um, I want to uh, change over now to the consumer privacy tool that we offer to users called Ghostry. Ghostry is a free browser plugin, um, which as you're uh, browsing through the web, lets you know what data collection companies are on any site you visit, and it gives you options for opting out as you wish. 
Um, GoStream to date has been downloaded by over 17 million people, 7 million of which have elected to be part of our opt-in GoStream panel. And this pan the panel members then feed back to Evadon all of the tag scripts and elements found on every page that they see as they browse the web. This vast big data, if you will, warehouse then becomes a resource for businesses like yourselves to receive information about tracking activity across the entire web. We currently have insight into over 26 million websites in a tagless way across the globe and therefore have the most detailed understanding of which tags are running and where that's available in the market. We've packaged this data into our Encompass suite of products that offer unique solutions for businesses who wish to do several crucial things in today's tracking landscape in order to both improve revenue and gain site control. First, they want to know who all the trackers are on their pages. Then they need to know how these trackers got under their site. Who are they being brought in by? Or who is their container tag bringing in? What kind of third parties that a publisher or brand may not know they have a relationship with, but who nevertheless have access to their consumer data? And third, knowing the performance of each tag, which are too slow, and do not capture the information they need to in order to work. Or which tags may be fast, but sitting behind a slower tag and which are hurting a user's experience because they load too slowly. Many of you may have seen this before, but there have been many studies that prove the correlation between website performance and both traffic and conversions. Uh, Walmart has hired an outside firm to study how performance affected their consumer experience and found that a 100 millisecond delay caused a 1% drop in revenue. And for those of you with non-e-commerce sites, they also found that a 500 millisecond delay caused a 20% drop in traffic. To put this into perspective, Evadon has found that once a page has an average of 20 or more trackers or elements, it has a 90% chance of having a page load of two seconds or greater. Most major publisher sites have more than 20 elements on key pages, so you can see the revenue loss implications when a company is not correctly monitoring and controlling all the tags across their site. Increasingly, companies are recognizing that someone in their organization needs to be responsible for the tracking activity across their pages. It's important to know which ad tech is bringing in which vendor and to know what data that vendor might be collecting. With new cookie technology, many vendors have access to consumer data through various ad tags even when they do not win an ad bid. And publishers need to be sure that they are not being eliminated from the revenue loop by solidifying agreements with ad tech so that everyone is on the same page about data collection and sharing. In order to do this, you have to know who the trackers are on your pages, not just those being monitored by a time manager and not just those placed directly on your site by you. You also need to have this information across all your pages not just for a handful of URLs. Improving your tag management site-wide will increase revenue by boosting performance, protecting your consumer base, and by, offering, and by increasing brand loyalty by offering consumers privacy tools. So to close up, what do you need to do in order to see this revenue increase? First, have a monitoring system in place with visibility across all your sites and pages so that you can tell not only who the trackers are, but how they got there and who they may be bringing in. Make sure you have agreements in place with your vendors about what data they're allowed to collect and share. And have a system in place that checks for the latency and performance of the tags across your site. And then lastly, establish a solution for both your website and your ads that offers consumers control over data collection. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you today. Todd and I have both enjoyed this opportunity. I also very much enjoyed both the Net Mining and Tango presentations. So thank you very much for including us in this discussion.
Great. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, uh, Jonathan, Dax, and Todd for this really informational session today. Um, looks like we definitely have uh, time for um, uh, one question that came in here. Uh, let me just pull it up. And I'll open this up to all of the presenters. Uh, what is the difference between RTB and programmatic buying? Hmm. Good question. This is uh, Dax at Chango. Uh, no one mind, I'll, I'll jump in on that one first. Um, uh, there, there's many different analogies and ways of, of looking at this. First of all, RTB is simply a method of buying inventory. Um, it just means real-time buying as opposed to making some decision in advance, agreeing a price, and, and then showing an ad typically across a block of inventory. So real-time is the method in which the media is made available. Programmatic is, uh, is then what you do with that media. And programmatic means pulling together lots of data to make a decision as to whether the data you're, sorry, as whether the media you're seeing in RTB has any value to you or not, and if it does, what is that value worth? So RTB simply the way of getting access to the media. Programmatic means it's the practice of making decisions as to whether the media you can access has value and at what value. Great. Thanks, Dax. Uh, and then the last question that just came in, uh, I think a lot of the presentation today focused on consumer advertising. But when it relates to B2B, do you see things like RTB and programmatic buying uh, being a viable way to reach people that way? I, at least uh, to John at NetMining, yeah, B2B is just, uh, it's still targeting, it's still customer characteristics, it's just a business trying to address someone in the position to make decisions about uh, products and services for their business. So as long as you have good data on which to decision, um, you can absolutely find those audiences uh, in, in the same way. It's just a function of how, you, how are you going to de define that target audience, what characteristics are you looking for, and then having the ability to employ certain data sets to go and find them. And from our experience, it can absolutely be done programmatically. I would, uh, I would absolutely echo that. I think there is a hang-up about B2B marketers being concerned about RTB, and actually some B2B campaigns are at best performing. The one thing you have to be aware of when you're planning in your data is that often somebody will be researching at work and may or may not be on the same device later on when you then go to show them an ad. And so you, you need to take that into account and, and plan for it. But otherwise, there is no reason at all why B2B marketers cannot win in, in RTB with a programmatic approach. Great. Okay, well, thanks once again to all of our presenters. Uh, looks like we're, we're just about out of time. So if there are questions here that we weren't able to answer, I will do my best to get, out, get back to you after this webinar. Uh, and it has been recorded, and hopefully by tomorrow morning you'll be able to find it on IEBnet backslash interactive insights webinars. All right. thanks everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.